Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center, um, I want to welcome you to Three Marjories, Three Visions of a Medieval Mystic, a reading and discussion that takes its inspiration from the 14th century medieval mystic Marjorie Kemp. My name is Quentin Ring, and I am the executive director of Beyond Baroque Literary Arts Center. Tonight, we're joined by three exceptional writers, Robert Gluck, Daniel Tiffany, Patty McCarthy, as well as by the medievalist Julie Orlemansky, um, who will be the moderator of our discussion towards the end of the program. Before I turn it over to them, I just wanted to say a few words about Beyond Baroque. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge Beyond Baroque's presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism, genocidal practices, and the violent dispossession of their lands. As many, as many of you know, Beyond Baroque is a literary space in Venice, California, and we are dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language through cultivating new writing, presenting contemporary literature and art, and building a diverse literary community. Uh, we're currently closed to the public, uh, but we do plan on reopening soon. We had hoped to do so by the end of this month, uh, but we decided to postpone due to the Omicron surge. Uh, for the time being, however, we do have ongoing uh, free workshops online. Um, every Monday, we have a fiction workshop, and every Wednesday, we have our historic Wednesday night poetry workshop. Um, we also have a few upcoming programs. Um, next week, we do have a retro retrospective celebration of the avant-garde Chicano poet Alfred Artego. That's on January 27th. Um, that has really a ton of great readers, uh, folks like Cherry Moraga, Luis J. Rodriguez, Juan Felipe Herrera, and many more. Um, so do come back for that. Um, Beyond our programming, I should mention that uh, the pandemic continues to have some very real effect on the finances of arts nonprofits such as Beyond Baroque. I would therefore very much appreciate any donations you can make as part of the evening. Uh, you'll find a link in the chat uh, to, to, to be able to do that or on our website as well. Um, but even more so than supporting Beyond Baroque, I would very much appreciate it if you consider supporting our writers uh, by buying their books. We'll also have a link for those. Um, for, for all of our writers' books in the chat. Um, so please do support them. I think you're gonna hear some really great readings and you'll wanna pick up those books as well. Um, so let's get to the program. I have to say uh, that I'm very grateful to the organizer of this program, Daniel Tiffany, for, su for suggesting it. Uh, it's long been my dream to offer some counter, counter program to Beyond Baroque's usual slate, um, which is to say I've, I've often wanted to present something um, that takes the pre-Baroque as its inspiration. So when Daniel suggested a program draws on the absolutely fascinating medieval visionary Marjorie Kemp, I jumped at it. Um, cheesy jokes aside, uh, he's assembled an incredible slate of writers um, that I'm just really, really looking forward to hearing their readings and also to hearing the discussion with Julie afterwards. So thank you, Daniel, for organizing this. Uh, thanks also to our assistant director, Jimmy Vega, who's running things behind the scenes. Um, so let me go ahead and just introduce the readers before we get started. Um, Robert Gluck's poetry collection include, uh, poetry collections include Reader, La Fontaine, a collaboration with Bruce Brun, and in, com in commemoration of the visit, a collaboration with Kathleen Fraser. Fiction includes the story collections, Denny Smith and Elements, and the novels Jack the Modernist and Marjorie Kemp, uh, which was republished in 2020 by New York Review of Book Classics. Uh, he edited with Camille Roy, Mary Berger, and Gail Scott, the anthology Biting the Error, Writers Explore Narrative, and his collected essays, Communal Nude, was published by Semiotext in 2016. He serves as director of San Francisco State's Poetry Center, co-director of the Small Press Traffic Literary Center, uh, and associate editor at Lapis Press. He lives in San Francisco. Daniel Tiffany is the author of six collections of poetry, published variously by Wesleyan, Omnidon, Nomi, Parlor Press, Tin Fish, and Action Books, including Cry Baby Mystic, his most recent title, uh, which we'll be reading from tonight. Uh, in addition, five volumes of his literary cr criticism have been appeared over the last two decades from presses such as Harvard, John, Johns Hopkins, and the University of Chicago. Apart from his own writing, his translations of French, Greek, and Italian authors can be found in various journals. He is a recipient of the Berlin Prize from the American Academy in Berlin. Patty McCarthy is the author of seven books of poetry, most, re most recently Wifting uh, from Apogee Press. She is a, a non-tenure track associate professor, professor at Temple University, where she teaches literature, creative writing, and first year writing. And our moderator, Julie Orlamansky, is associate professor of English at the University of Chicago and co-editor of Post Medieval, a journal of medieval cultural studies. Her scholarship focuses on practices of interpretation and imagination, 
whether in the Middle Ages or today. Her monograph, Symptomatic Subjects, Bodies, Medicine, and Causation in the Literature of Late Medieval English was published in 2019 by the University of Pennsylvania Press. She's, she is currently at work on two book-length projects, one concerned imagined, uh, imagined persons in medieval writing, the other considers the relations between fiction and religious belief. So for this program, we will have time for a Q&A discussion after the readings. Uh, please do save some questions to put in the chat for that. Um, thank you again to our writers and thank you, you know, to our audience, all of you for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Julie Orlamansky to say a few words about Marjorie Kemp. Thanks so much. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Quentin. Thank you um, for the invitation to be here today, Daniel, to read, um, to be alongside and in conversation with these amazing authors. So Marjorie Kemp, I'm just gonna say a couple minutes um, to get us launched in here. Marjorie Kemp, the historical person and author who's the absent center of tonight's event, was a middle-class woman, a middle-class laywoman and Christian visionary. Born in the later 14th century, around 1373, and flourishing at least until 1438. She's often said to be the author of the first autobiography in English, a work of Middle English prose known to us as the Book of Marjorie Kemp. Nearly everything we know about Marjorie comes from this book, which differs from modern day autobiographies in being focused less on the familiar benchmarks of a life than on Marjorie's experiences of divinity and the evidence of her sanctity. So we hear little in the book about her youth as the daughter of a prominent townsman and sometimes mayor of Lynn, and not much about the years of her marriage when she gave birth to 14 children. We find out much more about her encounters and conversations with Christ, her meditations and mystical visions, much more about the pilgrimages she undertook to Jerusalem and to other holy sites around Europe, about her negotiations with priests and church authorities, and the mingled joy and suffering that came along with her convulsive devotions. So I just want to make three quick points about Marjorie Kemp before we all have the pleasure of listening to these writers read. So first, Marjorie lived an unenclosed life. This would have been notable to people at the time. So she was not cloistered as nuns were, nor was she confined as an anchoress. Instead, she traveled widely and moved across roles and identities too, as wife, mother, widow, bride of the Godhead, born again virgin in white clothes and spiritual teacher. Second, Marjorie Kemp teetered on the knife's edge of orthodoxy and was frequently accused of heresy, a dire allegation in the years surrounding the Lollard uprising in England. But in each case, she managed to argue her way back into the community of right belief, despite whatever was unconventional or disruptive in her pieties. And third, perhaps most importantly for this literary event, Marjorie Kemp had a peculiar relation to the medium of writing. She was both inside and outside of writing, an author, but also illiterate, according to her own account. She relied on two different scribes, each unreliable in his own way, to write down her story. Partly as an artifact of this process, the book of Marjorie Kemp is not a story in the first person about an I, but one recounted in the third person about a she, a she, who is most frequently referred to as this creature, this creature, this created one. So just to give you a little flavor of the language from the book, than this creature of whom the treatise through the mercy of Jesu shall showen in party the living was touched be the hand of our Lord. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Patty and just everyone make sure to mute yourself. I think when people come in, they're not muted. So everyone be careful of that and I'll hand it over to Patty. Oh, thank you so much, Julie. That was so great. I could actually really just sit here and listen to you read from the book of poetry camp, and I would be so happy. That was really, really marvelous. Um, so I'm going to read uh, from this book, um, Wife Thing, and it's basically in three sections. The first part of it is 
uh, 25 sonnets and, and they're all called Marjorie Kempthing. Um, so I'm not gonna read all 25 of them. I'm actually gonna read um, for about 10 or so minutes. So I'm just gonna kind of jump around um, in, uh, in this first part of the book, um, which is really about reading the book of Marjorie Kemp, but it's not um, an attempt to sort of embody her or speak for her, um, but it's about kind of, I returned to reading that text after a very, very long time. Um, and, and, it prompted, uh, and it prompted this work. Marjorie Kemp thing. Not getting any closer to the offing, Marjorie Kemp gives birth in a hair shirt, a wife thing par excellence, a female patient's figure in her 14th confinement, a comfortable, finds a delusion that suits her status and lets no one come near or else she might shatter herself into a shardy mess. Marjorie Kemp, in lieu of an education, learns her prayers by heart and by rote, and maybe she mums them while chained up in the stockroom in her postpartum. Your daughter thing is sound asleep. Sorry if I got muted there for a second. Marjorie Kemp thing. Every double header is like Sunday. This is my secret. Let me put it in your ear. The main function of the patient's muscle is to lift the scapula. When naughtier was possessing nothing, did it rhyme with daughter? Not getting any closer, that which is most distant, I hold it in mine eye. Marjorie Kemp, it will be ugly, but it'll get done. Creature, tell the truth. Marjorie Kemp's soft, unforgiving body. She is sure there's no one looking except when she is raving. She smooths out her body, her hair shirt, the technicalities of little girl hair vernacular. Marjorie Kemp thing. The boys take their fighting into the barn. The pigeons take their omens down the chimney. This creature drinks coffee on the porch, a weather eye out and ears on the barn so that we all remain well within sound. The shadow of a bird in the grass over a sparrow in the grass tricks the weather eye like Sunday in its doubled movement. Marjorie Kemp's petty, neurotic, vain, illiterate, mental banality. Marjorie Kemp's little adolescent secret sin, that taste is secret in my mouth. And later, of course, she began to cry, heresy in the eye of the beheld. Marjorie Kemp thing, you wolf. What is this cloth that you put on, you strumpet, a dated noun of Middle English unknown origin, not of her own coming. Thou art coming here to lure our wife things from us and whether she means with her heart what she does with her mouth. Vernacular patience with ostentatious weeping, it's a lucky creature escaped the fire. Take it in the barn and sound it out, figure it out amongst yourselves. Marjorie Kemp gives birth and 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 gives birth. Marjorie Kemp is brought in for questioning and is arrested 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 and it's arrest is arrested and it's a lucky creature escapes the fire. Marjorie Kemp will not explain, you wolf, what is that? Will not explain to an unnamed man why she's crying. And she is first questioned in Latin and then in the steward's privacy where she's threatened with rape and prison. Marjorie Kemp swears to tell the truth when this creature remembers her youth, she fixates on her own strange childless body. Marjorie Kemp thing. She needs something to keep winter off her hair. A wife thing par excellence, a female patient's muscle is to lift the scapula. When this creature drinks coffee on the porch, Marjorie Kemp gives birth and gives birth and gives and is arrested and is arrested, shod and ridden like a pony to the devil. You are no good wife, poor thing. My patience fixates on her own strange childless body. Take it in the barn and sound like Sunday in its double movement. The truth, Marjorie Kemp's soft, unforgiving girl, the sound. Marjorie Kemp thing. A bird-witted boy, a bird-witted girl went over the top with the flowers like every place that has a long, hard winter. Beautiful, useless places. One use of bitch by a motherly character. What omen is a chimney-stuck pigeon? What omen is two types of daughter things? 
female, similar to male. Her plumage puts her secret in your ear learned by rote. Thou lies plainly and thou, thou lies falsely in plain English creature. Marjorie Kemp, when will she bring down the little birds, the shore birds, their long legs skitter and skip and pick their way across periwinkles and tide pools and mussel shards? Marjorie Kemp thing. No one's asking Marjorie Kemp the right questions. You wolf, what is that? And later she began to cry, of course. Creature, tell the truth. The sky is always beautiful here, he said. I'm bored. A patient braid is not your pigeon. The ambidexterity of the good wife will degenerate us both. Bird-witted boy chicks and daughter things alone. That's a cynical foul, poor thing, a vernacular pigtail technicality. The main function of the female patient's figure in a sawed off skirt and take me in the arms and kiss in my mouth, my head and my feet as sweetly slide under me. Marjorie Kemp thing. 38 years I lived with my husband when I was not on pilgrimages or locked up in the buttery saying prayers by rote. 38 years and 14 children I lived with my husband. I am no virgin. I am no heretic either. Marjorie Kemp conceives in a hair shirt, a last child, a lapse, this sentence from several failed attempts. Marjorie Kemp was not embarrassed, had many full, delectable thoughts, fleshly lust, and inordinately loves to his person. We cannot count the blackbirds in the tree fast enough. They move about and fly away, disappointed that I am not my husband. Marjorie Kemp thing. She cries because the sky is between them. The stars are in the way of your face, she says. Marjorie Kemp, you need to eat something. The full plates lined up before you on the bar and I know all about patience. A shipwreck, no virgin, inordinately loved his body. 38 years I lived with overlapped my husband. Closed curves within an enclosing rectangle in which the daily crossword passed between us at breakfast. I can think of no words today, where, there. I cannot remember how to get from there to there. They're there now, these crimes are excessive. When she sees a man hit a child or a horse. Marjorie Kemp thing. A cluster and a blister are both red injuries to the skin, he said at bedtime. A growing pile of choirs, the way in which ladies write history concerning ladies, the way in which 14 crimes in one terrible day, a domestic sky and a lights lines the roof. Marjorie Kemp presses cool fingers to her eyelids repeatedly, passes quarter-sized clots called the midwife, and her body betrays her in a new way, or an old way that's new to her. And on the smoke shelf, a pigeon sits and waits to be dislodged, gentle, gentle, with a soft broom. Marjorie Kemp thing. We draw winter word, we rhyme with daughter. We in lieu, we sound, we rave vernacular. We technicalities, we fight in barns, we weather eye, we pigeon, we double movement. We secret in my mouth, we cry, we heretics, we wolves, we birth, we birth. We winter word, we cluster, we bristle, we choir. We escape the fire, we lucky creatures. We Latin, we good wives, we daughter things, we patience figures, we soft, unforgiving. We winter off, we stork, we boy chicks, we inordinate love, we hair shirt, we lapse. We churched, we bloody, we slide, we between, we Marjorie Kemp, we, we gentle bedtime. Marjorie Kemp thing. Marjorie Kemp invents the autobiography and vernacular tell-all the backs of quiet houses from the train. A month and a half of inconvenient Sundays, winter, gorgeous, warm schools. Marjorie Kemp, you've done my head in. We draw in, we winter rhyme, daughter thing. The background landscape, a single setting. Simultaneous experience of six major life events. Birth, childhood, marriage, birth, angels tying the future, hair shirt. The marriage of a virgin with five episodes, which led her here to wed, inevitable wife thing, patience figure, kiss in my mouth. Marjorie Kemp thing. The poem for the first baby is easy. For the first time you fuck someone, Marjorie Kemp, that means suave. But what about the hundredth, the hundred hundredth time when your body is not the one that shivered and that shift and said, don't worry, I'm not afraid of you. Marjorie Kemp invents in vulgar tongue, 
It's better to marry than to burn. And I mean with my heart what you do with your mouth. We draw winter word, we marry and burn. One hundred hundred times inordinately his body, suffer me to meddle with you again, swivel. Suffer me this domestic tongue in ordinary use. Marjorie Kempthing, your grammar has driven me outdoors. First, Marjorie Kemp told her book to her son, but it was neither good English nor Deutsch. The letters not formed as other letters been. The use of characters no one could read, no one but her son, one supposes. So the son made a beautiful, illegible book because everyone's mother is incomprehensible. We shared this mess, a sweet bird's voice in her ear singing, the wrong bird and the wrong season. This creature illiterate did not notice her son's strange invented letters, bottom to top formation, impatience, burn what letters you have in my hand. Marjorie Kempthing, whatever letters you have in my completely illegible hand, but of my husband's body and by whom I've borne 14 children, my disorderly, my excessive, my dear worthy daughter with a hair shirt in her thin heart, this creature in hot weather, in the most distant part of your grammar. The church opposite, intentionally the same color as the season. In lieu of an education, a catechismal series learned by rote. The said creature lay full still, put it in my illiterate ear. A splinter and a cluster are both red, and I mean them with my whole vulgar tongue. Thank you all very much. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah, I guess I just unmuted myself. I guess now you can message someone to unmute, to ask them to unmute themselves instead of just gesticulating and going, you know, like <laughs> whatever it is. Anyway, we're making progress here. Um, anyway, I, I just thought, um, God, listening to Patty's, uh, work was just amazing I, I mean i just thought it was um you know just perfectly lucid and strange and also uh, what i think is was amazing was that it felt so so very much of the, of our own moment um completely true in that sense not um a kind of archaism and and yet it, you know it, it, it had that um, remoteness at the same time. So I, I, I feel really lucky to be reading after you, Julie. It just, um, it just felt like it was so alerting your poetry, just opened all of our pores and minds. So thank you. Um, anyway, uh, just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, and uh, it's thrilling to read with Bob and Patty and hear what Julie has to say. Um, you know, I, I just making me think and so many different things, but, um, anyway, and I, and I wanted to thank, uh, Quentin Ring, who's a fairly recent, uh, new, uh, director of Beyond Baroque and is, um, keeping the flame, you know, keeping Beyond Baroque at the forefront of new art and poetry in LA. So thank you, Quentin. I know it's been a hard year, uh, to start things off. Um, Anyway, Beyond Broke's a place where I've come many times. I live down just a couple of blocks down. So um, um, I'm going to read parts of a book length poem called Crybaby Mystic. Uh, it's a poem compelled, I confess, uh, by Marjorie Kemp's unsettling reference to herself in the third person as the creature, as Julie um, brought out, but which she brought out uh, an angle on it, which I hadn't thought of, which was the creator. Um, but um, a way of calling and calling to uh, herself, uh, which evokes the humiliation and hostility she often endured um, from very worldly, in very worldly ways and in imagined spiritual ways. Um, 
and and this poem my poem is fueled by strong feelings um and by the way that extreme feelings can induce as Ava Hess once noted a sense of the absurd um and I'll say just a quick word about the poem's form um the voice in this poem is built on a platform of hundreds of tiny units uh, each of them is composed of 22 syllables and divided into five lines with syllable lengths of two, four, six, eight, two. Uh, so it's a ragged little stanza. It's called a Senken. It was invented by Adelaide Crapsey, a very interesting poet and linguist, American, uh, who invented this stanza in the late 19th century. Um, and the Senken is employed by Crapsey and other poets in a manner similar to the haiku or the tanka, a single brief poem, but it functions in my poem as a kind of engine that propels the entire poem onwards. The voice is fabricated by packing it then tightly and strict, strictly into these units and then by letting them careen off in various ways. So the poem tracks this synthetic voice through a seemingly endless chain of predicaments. We know just when to stop. They deliver a mess. We go by the book, whoever it is. Ear pitched to the ocean floor. Clouds of furious green, one creature holds out against our tricks. Moon can't choose where it goes. A spoon will do. Plucking down signals, she turns to eyeless stone as if her crying bouts could not yet be annexed to listen her way in with her mouth. Not yet. Dead leaves and dirty stars. The door's unlocked. She'll slow things down and gnaw your backbone half in two. Beggar bold, honey swat. God, this place is freezing. Bareback telepath, not just her own thoughts. A horse shows up half dead with a hood pulled over its head, dreaming of what it's like to live unseen. I'm sure it won't be bribed with sugar cubes. Use cold water, it's faster. Drain the head. Traffic spins backward through the glass redoubt. Could that be why scratchy names make a blue moon bleed? I know you don't just leave a walnut sitting there. No one would dare leave a walnut behind. That shack where the road ends weren't nothing she knowed of. Red and dark, red and dark. Nope, not in here you don't. Fool, back out of the smoke, hold a candle to your chin. Gorgon City. On Margaret's orders, my Cavendish, the doorbell is fucked. I won't be sad in this world, just listen. As if names could sound like hammers when the sky blows into your mouth. How big things seem seen through a keyhole. Whoever is spying barricades herself, like the thing spied upon. No law down here. A bit like a first night's sleep after someone's been buried, as if daybreak might find the odd house ringed by horses. At those bleak altitudes, how much less on those, those who are saved? How much less? 
and as it happens said creature of whom this book is written was present there too giving the chairs and tables goosebumps. Popularity is the bottom 20% of words. In her private language, mirror means shovel. Not jonesing, a euphemism for the day-to-day -day experience of being pursued by objects having nothing to do with one's life. Trust like a spider's web. Goya's flashbulb. Miss Humpty Dumpty appears to be confused. One, two, bird flew. She leans against the fire escape. The local fence churning tugboat scuttle in the amen corner, locked down, God all over the floor. It is the dregs birds crave. Puddles sometimes glow, but not for long. A kiss lights up around your mouth when you die. Some say, don't go around counting people. Why not? They can't tell. Same with the necklace business, a face pissed in the snow. No one could have guessed that I'd be dragging myself like a trunk through the fields. Instead, it just happened. I tiptoed past the guard, fearing I understood only half of what I'd promised to do. Riding home, sky hooked on a white pig, and someone says, turn back. But then I'll die, I say. So I turn back, <laughs> waiting by myself for them to cut up the rest. And then what? Day gets pulled cockeyed into the ground somewhere between the palm and her nipple. I live in love longing. Along came a shelling girl. She put me in her pail. Just me and the sand dollars. LA, the night cream capital of the world. Even cops here use this stuff. The mask type is not well known for sibling murder. Bee eaters ride secretary birds side saddle. Full, whoa, the warp, honey, an awful fix. Ah, uh, one last thing to see about. The lies themselves began to take me at my word. Cord wrapped around a broken pump, letting itself be examined mercilessly. Who says palaces ever were neat and clean? What with all my friends here, eye winker, penny wipe, lick pan, nose smeller, mouth eater, chin chopper. Bones may be dropped, from great heights to break them open on the slopes of Mount Quarantine. We still need to give up the nest in our skulls, swing wide of the earth. Mouth wants to be alone. I look at the trees. They may not be drunk. The nut vendor is not the cop, but he could be. You must keep your wish to make your wish come true. You must keep your wishes and keep your wishes. You must keep your wish. Surely there is an end. And our expectations will not be put off much squatting beside the keyhole, unawares. Tipping up, upending the project, pseudo-epic is epic. Who, wear, who wears the ears around here? Miss Bit Middle Mess, out all night, the one kicking in my stall. Thank you.
No one told me about pagan psychoanalysis. Moot flips to fill her sorrow. Girl has got into her altitudes, a twig that's possessed. She tricked Hitler into a snowstorm. Don't ask me how. Wait a sec, could that be her? She knits up her cold but kissy shoulders. Either of you boys want a Coke? She says. I hear a smile impaled on the coat rack. God, this place could set you back. Eyes glued to the breach. Yeah, everything's locked on everything else. There goes my chance. She played a gas station attendant whose gaudy eye deceived me into destruction. That thing between us, fresh orphan junk. Okay, okay, summons crying wolf. I buried half and wiped my tracks. Angelic something, she said, a brace of impeccables, sobrized, vaporish. Little bell call you, big boy, big bell warn you, answer the door. If you don't want bad dreams to put mouth and forehead as far apart as a face can be. And no damn door. What do you say to that? She'll get the door, then I'll get it. No louder than a branch cracking. I'd hammer my fool self to death and pipe in a quibble Senselessness kicked over the wig scene back in the day, is my guess. You'll get your dress dirty down here. And you won't be able to stop crying when it starts. The strange sounds made by birds detained in airless burrows recall the noises shoemakers make working alone in their clutter. Through her skin, you could see a road beating a path to my door through the cricket smoke. Now that she's gone, she lifts her hands, hollering, please don't let him hurt my boy. But she's got no shoes on, I see. That a fence there chuckling to itself? Is that a wig stopping the drain? whether absent or present or kleptoparasitic, someone set them on fire. She found him and numbered him and poured him out. Unvitrioled Skylark and hoax in common. Um, forgive me for asking, I didn't start my, does anyone know how long I've been reading? <laughs> 10 minutes, maybe 12, 15 minutes. No, okay. Um, I'll read another minute or two, sorry. Some call it an egg tooth, same spurious prologue breath lobe made of gauze and twine and snowflakes. Never mind what it's called. It sleeps under a bridge. It burns through stuff, cracking down. It can't be found. Apt to pinch the odd ruderal plant. It rhymes with Creole for knob, her left eye shimmering. I took my hat off as I walked to see if the lace were not scorched, thinking it had brushed down a star. Things compared to numbers. Intricate, so intricate. Almost gave myself half a lump trying. I watched a guy lose 10 grand crying through the lock. 
I brushed the ants aside. That fetch won't get you in. A phrase that would one day make perfect sense. I tried to sleep it off. My eyes clattered open. Someone was trying to swim upstream, upriver that night. I knocked at the door. What could she be laughing about? That greenish tinge prefigured her extraction from the world, not mine. Souls, if not volunteers, strangle each other at birth. I would wax the inside too. It's even more scorched. The flowers growing dizzy from being breathed in. So much shyness. When it blusters, it would rather break its own rib than crack a branch to house the crash in the floodlit toys. Say yes, and you wish you hadn't. Knowledge of the entire room sleeps in the mirror. Fish being the fish's lone thought pattern. The bread box is sparkling too much. The chair must be the one daydreaming, not me. And while she was clearing out the place, I asked her about proper names and void stepping. Thank you. Forgive me if this went on too long. Um, and uh, I hope that wasn't too, too long. Um, but I just wanted to pass it with great anticipation and excitement and uh, someone whose writing I admire enormously, Bob Cook. Thank you. All right. Please nod. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you, Beyond Baroque. Gratitude to Daniel and Patty for their lovely books. I love the elastic uh, feeling of elasticity in Patty's writing with the repeated lines that keep making it seem like a tapestry and Daniel for all that glimmering this. And thank you, Julie, for moderating. Uh, since, since there's so much about tears, uh, I thought I would start with a little chapter about Marjorie crying to, to be germane. Jesus, when I feel the difference between my stale life and the ecstasy of life with you, I revive the desolation I felt before meeting you in order to coax your appearance. I begin crying so intensely that my voice sounds hoarse and strange. My face becomes rigid, my arms and legs grow weak, and the civilization increases in tenderness and sensitivity to pain. There is a bleating in my chest, a sixth sense, the continuous awareness of your body. I enlarge myself by equating your tenderness towards me with the pain of your death. My jaws lock open, tears and mucus spool off my face. I'm on my stomach in a side chapel at St. Margaret's. My hip bones press against the floor, gas moves through my, the side of my gut. My hot cheek grinds on the stone. My crying is choked. I curl into a ball and clench in an impossible shape. I put myself in your body. Its frequency is so high it heaves upwards. You need me as you did at first. In our most intense union, the opposite feeling enters. Disorder, the strangeness of what's happening to me. Tears don't stop, but convulsions do. The more I need you, the deeper the estrangement, the stronger my desire, a defect in the movement of love. I'm so tired of being alone. I swim through my tears to the back of my head to observe this, my crying regular as a swimmer's breath. That retreat allows ghosts to enter. You stumble towards me, 
as a rickety man, one leg keeps caving in. You say with complete understanding, if it weren't for my body, I could go on forever. We fall into each other's arms. And as we grieve, I rejoice. A welling feeling of life, which now even pain stimulates. I become aroused as the flat pungent odor makes my gorge rise. I promise that I will save you. Your eyes darken and your face falls away. The stench of decay spreads as I make the pledge. Your tongue is stiff as the metal clapper of a bell, purple brown like burnt iron, everything wasted. I witness my anguish with excitement. Who would reject more life? In my bleak, monotonous weeping, I wonder at the very terms of suffering's argument. That you are, my love is, you die, flesh is, a baffling confirmation. It's not pain or joy until wept out as fiery tears. That outburst causes a tooth of pleasure to bite hard. Currents travel through me to the distance. When I finish crying, I'm empty, exalted. Withdraw my tears and I do not enjoy food, drink or talk. There is no flavor until I weep again. That's from the beginning of the book. And uh, this was written 25 years ago, a little more, and uh, in the middle of the AIDS epidemic, just to say, just to make that observation. So here she is uh, back, she's gone and she's come back uh, to England. She's gone on a lot of travels. In Leicester on a porch invaded by honeysuckle, the ostlers in a blue shift daughter made a circle with her hands and brought them over her head without unclasping. Marjorie knew that the girl had recently acquired an acute sense of smell and was almost always aware of the scent of her own cunt. When the girl saw her sister's clitoris, she said, mine's bigger than hers. Eggs began drifting through fallopian wastelands. The girl liked to stroke her newly growing breasts, but when she lay on her stomach, they hurt. She was always tempted to run away. She got to the front gate and looked up through wild eyes at Marjorie, who told her that she would have a lot of pleasure in life if she lasted that long. Her father, the ostler, ran up to Marjorie's room and grabbed her scrip. The law was etched into his very grain. He wouldn't let Marjorie finish a letter. She was asking John to take her home because traveling alone was dangerous. She had a, she had a dubious reputation. Like any fanatic, she wanted to show the world what she had become. She could have avoided trouble. Instead, she harangued people, an unlicensed preacher, maybe subversive. The ostler rushed Marjorie to, Marjorie to the mayor through narrow streets that led to the guild hall. The ostler was worried about the future. It was his duty as a citizen to protect the state against heretics now that the king was away unleashing English power. They came to an iron pole he'd used to climb. He'd gone up and slid down, gone up until he got some kind of orgasm rushing through his thighs. He pressed his face against the metal, a steely scent, musty and gray. Death was learning to speak. Cobblers, harness makers, potters, glovers, gilders, spicers, smiths and skinners, they worked harder and harder, but their labor was a kind of apathy as though their isolation and endless equivalence were the ostler's dreams materialized. Peasants danced in the churchyard to a hurdy-gurdy, arms and legs thrown out like swastikas. Marjorie could not believe her eyes. Her indignation kept them dancing night and day for a whole year. Her miracle was mean-spirited. They danced themselves waist deep into the ground. The mayor was an ash blonde with perfectly chiseled features. His words, hello, the words hello or please cost him too much to be wasted on an underling. As soon as he saw Marjorie, he cried, Dick mihi nomen amantis. The devil could answer dif difficult questions in good Latin. How should crescite et multiplicamini be understood? 
Heretic said it justified free love. Priest stood around to hear her reply and a soldier leaned on a pike with a sprocket. Speak English, I don't understand what you are saying. Speak English, speak English, he minced as though lying were lecherous. You are a liar in plain English. He would have been stunning, but his nervous mouth always chewed on his cheek. I will burn you, whore, lollar, deceiver of the people. He expected Marjorie to drop to her knees in bed. She said, I am ready to goon to, to prison as, the, as they are and ready to go to Kirka. Ah, said the mayor with a meaningless smile. On the second Wednesday of July, Marjorie was brought to the church of All Hallows before the high altar where the abbot of Leicester and some canons were seated. There were friars, priests, and town folk who came to see if Marjorie would be burnt. So, met, so many they jostled and scrambled onto stools. They were coarse, a wave of acrid sweat, faces and hands add, added later. The mayor cried silence, and the abbot put on his spectacles and looked around to see who was talking. The mayor wore a blue silk mantle with an orange border. He wondered if the fear in Marjorie's eyes when she saw him was mirrored in his own. Marjorie knelt before the altar and held her palms up in the position of piety. It was a scene from a penny broadside, the clumsy perspective jumble, the figures partaking of the wooden block that made them. The mayor shouted, what have you done with the baby conceived in adultery and spawned when you were abroad? Marjorie was thunderstruck. Slander had thrown its spear decked with ears. The charge of sedition is is often framed as a sexual crime. Sir, she said, I never had part of any man's body in this world, excepting John Kemp's by whom I have borne 14 children. The mayor turned red as a beet. The Lollards were gaining strength in his city. She does not mean with her heart what she says with her mouth. The mayor was so full of grievance, he stepped from side to side like a boxer. He was rich and uncomprehending surprised that anyone would object to being mistreated by him. Why do you dress in white? You have come to lure our wives from us and lead them off. Marjorie snorted. He was accusing her of being a fla flagellant Albi who roamed from town to town whipping themselves. You are not worthy to know why I wear white, but if the court were cleared of laymen, I would tell the clerics as though in confession. Then the clerks prayed the mayor to go down from him with the other people. The mayor's voice grated with rage. I will not let you go in spite of anything until you get a letter from my Lord Bishop of Lincoln. You are in his jurisdiction. Marjorie shouted, I am no heretic. She hid her hands under her mantle and did not know how compelling she was. Her certainty aroused Jesus. The abbot of Leicester looked more like a god than Jesus' father, with fierce gray circumflex eyebrows, heavy pouches, and fiery red eyes. He glared at Marjorie and asked with rich indignation, are you a Christian or a Jew, a woman or not? Marjorie tilted her head as Jesus sang, the kiss you gave me, burning and bold, ran off with two birds, and flew to their tree to guard their nest from the cold. Her delight was startling because so inappropriate. She tipped her ear to contain his voice and felt the warm sensation of hearing that comes before orgasm. What can I do but whisper this and beg you for another kiss? Marjorie dropped to the floor, face churning, tears falling, a black hooded church doctor declared, it's all her fancy, she has no sorrow. The abbot barked, be quiet. The doctor shriveled as though to escape a blow. The abbot said to Marjorie, why do you weep? His face was lightning, looking for ground. You will wish someday you wept as sorely as I. I hear you are a wicked woman. I hear you are a wicked man. If you are as wicked as they say, you'll never get to heaven. Why you? What do people say? Other people, sir, can tell you. She flushed with power on the infinite point she was making. 
She speaks against the church, the doctor complained. She told me the worst story I ever heard. Marjorie climbed to her feet, expanding on the limitless plane of her voice. A priest got lost in the forest. He found an arbor with a young pear in the middle, in the middle covered in blossom. A huge bear, ugly and rank, shook the tree till the blossoms fell. The bear ate all the flowers, turned his tail, and sprayed the priest with watery shit. The priest was disgusted and very depressed because he could see the shit was symbolic. He met a handsome old man who asked the priest why he was sad. The priest repeated the matter. Rank beast devours blossoms and sprays them horribly out its ass. The old man explained, you act without faith. You sit over your beer. You give yourself up to your body. I don't believe there's a crumb of sense in it, the doctor stated. The abbot thought, I would give 20 pounds to have her tears. He said hopelessly, that's a good story. Quick stages of tearing down and reconstruction replaced themselves on the doctor's face. He said, good story, submissive. Marjorie nodded with pleasure. If anyone dislikes it, watch him, he's guilty. Who will escort this woman to the Bishop of Lincoln? A young man jumped up. He had a deer's passionate eyes, edible flesh and furry rump. He was still preoccupied by the growth of his cock during puberty. The abbot said, too young. Thomas was a so sober man of the court. He asked, what will you give me? His eyes were so close in his narrow face they made you dizzy. The abbot offered five shillings and Thomas demanded a noble. Here is five shillings, escort her quickly out of this area. I'm gonna read just a minute or two more uh, because I wanted to get to the Philip, the Bishop of Lincoln, who was modeled on Kevin Killian. So it's like have, inviting Kevin into the reading. Philip, Bishop of Lincoln had presided over Marjorie's vow of chastity. First, she went to, to Leicester Abbey and into the church. A peacock angel opened a mandarilla in the bulging air in which Jesus sat naked on his three-legged stool. She was used to swallowing him whole. Anticipation elongated her body and arched her forehead. Jesus walked towards her. His milky skin was so fine his veins were visible. Her knees buckled. She held onto a pillar and felt as though she were running. The unruly outside was sucked into her body with her breath. He was grinding every grain of separate existence to dust. A thick swarm buzzed louder towards a longed for and intolerable crescendo. The excitement was also a light sense of well-being that tapered her fingers and lifted her lips and nipples. She was moved but also disturbed by his torso, a face without features. Jesus lowered his lids and tipped his head back, basking and effeminate. Two tiny points of hair on his chin wore his beard. She questioned her attraction and answered, yes, it was strong. The next day, Thomas brought her to the bishop's palace. Bishop was still in bed. I'm skipping a little. Finally, the bishop entered wearing a jerks, jerkin of otter skin and a plain green coat. He circulated among his guests, isolated in his mannerisms, existing entirely at the level of delighted greetings and a rush of compliments. He squirmed with pleasure to see Marjorie and asked after John. Her old affection for John resurfaced as a remorse, his tremulous sweetness and the purity of his open face. Philip insisted that she was doing him a favor by accepting his letter. He invited her to dine with him. It was disconcerting to be with someone so happy. Philip sat with his back to a huge fireplace. Sparks flew upwards above the round plated fire screen. Mint and fennel were strewn on the floor to sweeten the air. His pantler and carver stood by and his cup bearer poured French wines. His cup bearer was so young that when he came, his body arched like a swag of fruit that dangled above Philip's head. Marjorie joyfully ate cherries, then white bread, fresh beans, boiled in milk, roach and crab, eel pasties, rice cooked with milk of almonds and cinnamon, lamfreys baked in with a sauce, tarts, new cheese and fruit. Marjorie asked Philip as though in confession, which way should I go from here? 
Philip shook his face as though clearing away cobwebs of sleep. Her question was entirely novel. He furrowed his brow and pressed one finger against his forehead in exaggerated thought while Marjorie waited in silence. Finally, he said, that depends on where you want to get to. The bishop vanished quite slowly. The darkness of time was the darkness of unconscious life. Marjorie talked more urgently as his face faded and white stars began to shine through it. The air became white. The sky was yanked up at the corners. Storms of thunder, lightning, and heavy rain flattened the crops and blew petrels inland where they fluttered on gray wings like bats above the ponds. His grin, grin grew wider after the rest had gone, expression without content. Horses weighed belly deep into the water to crop the grass floating on the surface. In Leicester, thunder soured the beer. The mare grew lean with fright. The storm tore branches off old trees and the devil ripped the mare's soul out and flew away holding its corner at arm's length like a dirty napkin flapping in the wind. Okay, thank you. Yay, so I think the plan for um, the next about 20 minutes is to be in the glow, the dazzled glow of um, these three writers work. Um, I think I'm going to pose an initial question to each, each of them, um, which they should also feel free to ignore and kind of just reflect on the experience of hearing these three different refractions of, of Marjorie juxtaposed. And uh, we can just start the discussion there. Um, since we have so many people, I think it's probably easier for people to use the chat to pose their question. So if you wanna go ahead and put a question in the chat, I can kind of bring those forward. If you kind of feel like you really wanna ask your question, you know, you can raise your hand and we'll, um, make that happen hopefully make that happen um also um so that's kind of the vision for i think about the next 20 minutes of, of conversation um so thank you for those readings um so i'll just pose a couple of a couple of things here to get the conversation going my head is spinning with the with the beauty of those um readings um patty maybe i'll start with you since you read first and would love to just hear you talk a little bit about you know what you talk about as the vulgar tongue but and then what Daniel kind of invoked by talking about it's not language that isn't archaic but you know old middle English a sort of an archive of older words and actually kind of archival bits of language and how what you find in those is a poetic resource I was also struck kind of thinking about like old language about this fabulous iterative repetition that makes the words both familiar and animates them kind of in the present. Um, but yeah, would love to just hear you reflect a little about kind of Middle English in, in this text and, and, um, and how it's working in your poetry. Um, I absolutely love that question. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm a failed medievalist, actually. Uh, I, I, as an undergraduate, I was, I, I did mainly medieval and, uh, and intended to go to graduate school and, and be a proper medievalist, but I, I didn't. I went to graduate school, I got an MFA, and now I teach you know, 20th and 21st century. But it, they're not really that different in, 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 in some ways. But so, um, I mean, I, Middle English, I, I just always really liked because if you just read it out loud, it makes perfect sense, right? Like my Latin was kind of terrible and my uh, old English was kind of okay. Uh, but, you know, Middle English, it's great. You can just read it out loud and you can hear it. You can, you know, I feel, you know, I think that you can hear the history of how the language changes when you, when you read the Middle English out loud. Um, and, and I was also really glad about your question because it's actually why I went back to Marjorie Kemp, um, who as a person I felt kind of variously about at different points in my life. And when I was an undergraduate and doing mostly medieval, I, I read her very cynically. I actually loved the book of Marjorie Kemp, 
Um, but I read her completely cynically. I read um, her, I read her religiosity as, uh, as, as a way to get on the public stage. And that maybe is partly maybe true, right? I mean, she didn't have a whole lot of options, right, to have a public voice. Um, but I certainly read her vow of chastity in a completely cynical way. This woman just, you know, didn't want to have more than 14 children, you know. Um, and then as I got older, and actually, uh, certainly after becoming a parent, I, I read the beginning of the book of Marjorie Kemp very differently. You know, what seems to be clearly to be postpartum depression, if not postpartum psychosis. And, um, and, I, and I take her much more at her word, right, now that I'm a grown up. Um, and I also was really interested in this sort of physicality um, of her language and, and of her um, experience and that she's not at all embarrassed of, uh, you know, the physicality of her crying or the physicality of her relationship with her husband and sex and all of that. And, and, and as I got older, that became much more interesting to me and, you know, certainly the language of it. But like writing this book was really just about going back to reading her in Middle English and, and enjoying it. Um, just loving hearing um, her strange voice, right? Come through all these, uh, all these filters to us. Sorry, that was a long answer. That was wonderful. I mean, uh, I think you do a great job kind of bringing, you know, modern English into, you know, making it strange or making it feel different and then making the Middle English feel animate, you know, and present. So, um, Daniel, um, just, you know, I, I think one of, certainly one of my obsessions with the book of Marjorie Kemp is voice, and you sort of evoked this in your framing comment. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about this, you know, if your, your book, and it was so amazing to hear you voicing it, um, since I've been spending time with it on the page recently, and kind of this, you know, voices that won't hold together, um, this this holding together and pulling apart, I, you know, I, I guess I want to ask, does your book teach, like, does your book and Marjorie Kemp's book, do they teach us the same thing about voice? You know, do they, or or do you think there's something fundamentally different? I'm, I'm just, I found myself grappling as I was reading and I was just experiencing it. I mean, you might also talk, of course, about like line breaks and verse versus prose. Um, that would be another kind of point of uh, way into it, but but I, yeah, these are the things that I've been kind of grappling with, thinking about as I read your book and enjoyed your readings. Oh, you're muted. You're, you're muted. You're muted, Daniel. Um, anyway, I was just thanking Julie for um, giving us these questions, which are so generous and um, so interesting and helpful. You know, I mean, for voice, I guess your question is about voice. Um, and, um, um, you know, it's very hard um, in ways uh, because you have, a, you know, the Middle English of her text and then, and then um, contemporary versions of it. And I first read a contemporary version and then sort of went back to and read into. Um, so um, I guess, you know, that the the middle english was less important for me it's actually something that i've been really absorbed in, in in the past where other collections of poetry you know starting probably 10 15 years ago where they were built on sort of tag pieces of of, of um, middle english vernacular poetry basically some of it non-secular and and um so the weird thing was i got to this point where here's marjorie kemp here's like some kind of persona that's actually this is and i sort of that went away for me for the most part um and 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 the question of voice putting a voice together in, in on you know on the page was what preoccupied me rather than being um tuned in to middle english as a and um and to me it was both um very I, I mean, there's this tension between something that's highly synthetic and very constructed. I mean, um, you know, there's an enormous amount of um, sort of sample material in this poem. And 
so it's it's highly synthetic in the sense that I, I really do believe that you know that, that voice in terms of poetry is just you know a, a you know a synthetic um kind of production artifact which is wonderful and 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 you know joyful to sort of play to, with that you know but at the same time it's also for me maybe even more or at least in the same way t about tone so it's about a <clears throat> a kind of tonal experiment where i'm pulling on a lot of different um a kind of palette of different materials you know i would say probably six half a dozen different very distinct kind of sources and and tones and it's really about hearing the relationship um between those different tones so that they move and so that i end up trying to you know play with the velocity of the voice in terms of moving and slowing down and and that that's all um sort of um on the one hand highly synthetic but it's also just judged by it's a tonal issue it's about um hearing different le levels of diction and seeing how they anyway but so yeah it would um um yeah yeah that's great i mean in some sense i think the book of marjorie camp does teach us about synthetic voice but uh -huh. it, it much more than mood mm -hmm. right it seems to hold out like the lure of, of marjorie's body right that we're actually gonna we're finally gonna get her speaking but but that's you right. know less the case in your poem i think you're right that we have uh -huh. we have mood we have tone yeah. um but and there we have that kind of lure of we're finally gonna hear marjorie's voice um yeah that was just it was just so wonderful um Bob, I found your reading really um, moving and beautiful. And I guess I would just say, maybe I'll just notice something that I really um, appreciated in, in reading um, Marjorie Kemp this time was that you're dropping into various characters that are in the scenes. So, you know, the kind of Osler's daughter and the passage that you just read, dropping into her consciousness. I mean, I had marked a few a few moments um you know one is the vicar you know quite early on when marjorie goes and then we drop oh, yeah. into the vicar's um consciousness and i guess i was just i would love to just hear a little bit more about that if you have any thoughts about that often it sort of begins focalized through marjorie and then it and but then we're really there and i just it, it to me those are very powerful and um moments of yeah I don't, I don't even know if historical imagination is the right word that's not quite it but they're they're very powerful moments to me I didn't know if you had anything you to say. sure um uh in the first place I since I was writing about a woman of uh, uh, my main character um I felt I had to do some field work and uh, so I asked uh, I about 20 of my women friends to give me five observations about their bodies. And I also did a lot of reading. I read lesbian pornography and I did, uh, you know, I just, and I asked my women friends things that actually I don't think most men know, period, whether they're gay or straight or whatever they are. Um, you know, like just how does it feel to be in the body of a woman and and uh, sort of pestered my friends and then then i realized well it's the book isn't really going to be even you know they're balanced uh, so i asked my male friends for the same 20 male friends uh for the same thing and it was very surprising and it was very illuminating what the people gave me um but i wanted to Kind of invoke a, a community of physical uproar. I wanted to just layer all these nuggets, these sen sensual nuggets, relation to body, relation to death, disease, orgasm, whatever. Um, I wanted to just have a layer in the book of that, of 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 that, really, so almost like summoning this community into the book. Uh, and and creating a kind of the a, a commons like a commons of just physical intensity. So that was my idea in in doing that. Hmm. At some point, I have to find these. I've slave saved them all, and they would be a document 
on their own. Yeah, I would say so. You know, when I, when I come across, there's Tom Gunn, there's Kathleen Frazier, there's Carla Harriman, there's Camille Roy, there's Kevin, there's, you know, so it's also for me, very nice to come across these things. Okay, so I think we can open it. Thank you for these beautiful answers and this beautiful start to the conversation. We have questions um, in the chat. So maybe I'll um, read out a couple of them um, and we can sort of start the conversation that way. So um, Patty, thank you. This is from um, Sandra. Patty, thank you for your reading. Could you say a bit on wife thing, queen wife thing and good wife thing, what it means in middle English sense and your own sense? Um, uh, my, this is from Irina Dubitrescu. My question to all the poets, what do Marjorie's voice or Marjorie's body do for you and your work? Um, let's see. Everyone can probably read these, but it's useful to have them, I think, for the recording. Um, this is from Masha Raskolnikov. Um, uh, Robert, Bob, I've been reading and rereading your Marjorie Kemp book since a bad breakup in my early 20s and always <laughs> identified with the narratorial voice. What is it like to re-inhabit that voice now all these years later? Um, and also a thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, so do people want to respond to these? We have questions for everybody, sort of Marjorie's voice, Marjorie's body, we have wife thing. I think Patty, you might've responded in the chat, but um, Bob, anybody? Uh, uh... Well, I did have occasion to read it after 25 years uh, because it came out in a new edition. And uh, I have to say, I was very surprised. I thought I knew it. I mean, after writing it, I could have recited the whole book. I worked so hard on it and really inhabited the sentences. I just haunted them. But I, so I was surprised uh, by, uh, I shocked myself on occasion and I, I, um, I, it was running into, as I say, running into friends who happened to be in the book. Um, made my old boss, somebody who likes to, uh, archbishop who likes to burn heretics. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so yes, it was a surprise to me. After I was done with Marjorie, it took me years to write another sentence. I was so inside that sentence, which was really a, a collaboration between Marjorie's sentence and my sentence. And so it was, it was a strange experience going back into it, like a haunted room. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm dear friends with the person who was ill. Um, uh, but so it, I was uh, actually a little upset on his behalf. <laughs> you know, when you write a book about, about uh, romantic revenge, I guess you could say. Um, uh, you're stuck with the relationship for like five years. The other person can go off and have other relationships, but there you are. And also you can't, you can't, uh, it can't just be that, or you just look like a big jerk. So then you have to see the other person's point of view. You're forced into it by the writing itself in order to make a good book. So yes, it's a very, I'm, I'm, no more, no more novels of romantic despair. I hope. <laughs> Can I just say something? Actually, um, that when I was so the Marjorie Kemp part of Wife thing was the first part that I wrote. So I don't. I mean, it's got to be at least seven or eight years ago. I was writing those poems, and so I've been reading them and readings for a long time. And I think almost every time I read from the Marjorie Kemp poem, someone after the reading would say, well, are you reading Robert Gluck's Marjorie Kemp? Oh. And I said, and I didn't, I, the whole time I wrote it, I, I very, I could not. I said, no, I'm not, and I can't, and I can't read it until the book is over because I had read it, as I was saying before the reading, I'd read it in graduate school when it came out. Um, and um, and I was like, I just think that it would totally, it would totally screw me up. I would be just thinking about Bob Gluck's Marjorie Kemp, but I think I have to just think about Marjorie Kemp. But it was, I just wanted to tell you that 
I swear, every time I read from it, <laughs> and I said, well, if you're writing that, are you reading Robert Gluck's Marcia Cup? So for years. <laughs> wow. No, and, uh, and I actually, I, I really want to read it in the new edition. So I can now safely, I can safely read it again. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I, I also didn't, I didn't read anybody's work. There, even in 95, there was very good work on Marjorie, but I didn't read it in, until later. Yeah, I only read, I only read criticism very early. And then I realized that that was going to be a problem. And so then I just read Marjorie Kemp for the rest of the time. Daniel, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated and it doesn't surprise me that each of us in ways are talking about the separateness of our projects, this kind of monadic sense of relations of, you know, a causal relations um, <laughs> of not knowing of each other's work, which is true for me, and 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 how obviously very different the work is. But I just wanted to put something up that maybe could be a question for all of us, and um, which is that, of course, as the, each of us, Bob and Patty and myself, listening to each other's texts, we immediately hear the common um, samples that we take, what we take out of the text, and I have to say for the audience, for everyone here, if you aren't familiar with the book, there are certainly people here that are familiar with it and you might be hearing these chime, this chiming going off, but there are a striking number of reference of choices that each of us that Patty mm -hmm. and Bob and I made mm -hmm. to pull out of the text that are the same images, the same phrases. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, it's like, to me, this is very interesting about what we as contemporary, I mean, very different writers, mm -hmm. you know, at different points in our career, at different moments historically, are um, somehow pulling, um, a, you know, a number of very similar phrases and episodes out of the, the text. And so I just wondered what that tells us about um, um, you know, about um, a sense of commonality, first of all, about what Marjorie is in the way that she somehow is speaking to us, you know, at this subliminal level collectively in ways that are that involve a kind of solidarity and in, that also involve difference, um, which to me is very interesting about how you talk about solidarity or totality or community. And um, so I guess I, I just wonder what people would make of that, um, you know, um, one is especially, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, it, it struck me and it was encouraging to me. Um, yeah, I'll just throw two last questions into the mix with Daniels and we can respond to those and then and wrap it up. So one is um, Cecily asked about the ongoing appeal of Marjorie. And so this kind of ties into that, you know, what is alive, what is appealing, what's, you know, ongoingly um, impassioning about Marjorie. And also um, Stacey Voss asks about um, how people came to Marjorie in the first place. So again, kind of what is what leapt out and kind of seized, um, seized people um, in, in Marjorie's um, text. So, but I think Daniel's made a kind of, yeah, very precise observation about um, the shared phrases and images. So, yeah. Well, for me, it's what the means to write an autobiography. I, 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 mm -hmm. I think that the difference between what Marjorie thought she was doing mm -hmm. and what she actually was doing is endlessly interesting. Oh, yeah. And it's really like the beginning of modern times. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, her, she's modeling her book on books that were very common, uh, uh, St. Bridget of Sweden, all these models that she had. But instead, she's writing a book in which experience itself is not really known. There's not a way to really assess it and to, to um, draw a conclusion. So it's really not so much about here's how you should live, here's what you should believe, but to, what, what does experience mean? And for me, that's the draw, that's that, that that disjunction is what drew me in. Um, but I couldn't, I actually started writing a, I was introduced to her in the early 60s at UCLA in a, 
in a medieval, uh, just a little, a few pages. There wasn't, it, it, she wasn't known at all. Um, and that, and I was really interested in her. I even wrote, started writing a musical comedy based on her life that I was going to end with the crucifixion. Um, and so what, I mean, I even have songs and things that I was writing and then I thought, oh my God, what a, I'm a hippie in San Francisco. Like, how, how is this gonna work? But then, uh, so I shelved it. And then much later when I, I would say heartbroken, midlife crisis, HIV, uh, I found a way back into her book on a, in a much different, a, in a much different level. So that's me. Daniel, Patty, responding to any of these things, the shared phrases, how Marjorie came to you, ongoing vitality of this book. Um, how Marjorie came to me um, is that uh, she was assigned to me. <laughs> she, Marjorie was assigned to me in my first medieval survey um, as, an, as an undergraduate. And Marjorie came back to me because even when I thought that I couldn't uh, possibly, that I couldn't get past my cynicism and suspicion of her motivations. I couldn't stop thinking about her. And I thought about her for years and years. And I mean, I read it more than once as an undergraduate um, and, and eventually as an undergraduate came to really love the book, even when I wasn't sure how I felt about her as a person, but it's kind of going back to things that Daniel and Bob have both said about, um the the use of the third person and and what she thinks she's doing and and what autobiography means to her i just i couldn't stop thinking about her and then i avoided her for a very long time i i didn't want to go back and read it and i definitely didn't want to write about her and i was never going to write about her and then i got older and decided to write what I wanted to write. <laughs> and so I went back to her with great, with great pleasure. Oh, I'll throw in like Patty. Also, I, I was a, a, a failed medievalist. Wow, great launching, great <laughs> launching pad. I'm gonna start using that in the advertisements for my classes. Wanna be a great poet? Okay, start here. Um, Daniel, do you want to add anything? I'm going to hold up everyone's beautiful book and model them while we're doing this. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. Daniel, you're muted. Thank you. So good that message anyway. Um, yeah, I was just saying that I loved what Bob said about um, the idea that in response to the question of well, what does it mean that we were all picking on the same details in the text, not all the same, of course, but but we share a number of things that we sample and pull in. And and I loved what you said about the idea that, well, of course, this means that we're writing an autobiography and we're historical. We're writing from a historical moment. And, um, uh, you know, um, I, I yeah, it's it's um anyway, I just wanted to say that that um um that I, I yeah. I I have three questions in my mind at once, one for Julie, one for Patty, and one for Bob. <laughs> so um I think I'll I'll sort of you know pause here at at, at the moment and come back. We're at we're at an hour and a half, which is the scheduled length of our time uh, of our time. So I think we probably should wrap it up. But I'm so grateful to these three brilliant writers for sharing their voices um, tonight. And here are their books. They're wonderful. I've spent a lot of time with them in the last few weeks. So I encourage you to read them together. As you've heard tonight, it's a rich and um, fabulous and dizzying experience. And so. Bravo, and thank you to the audience. Um, the chat will be saved in this video. I think will eventually make its way online. So um, thank you, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Daniel and Bob. It was an honor to be with you. And thank you so much, Julie. Total honor and, and, and really loved having you here. I was very nervous about you being here, but it was actually really great. And thank you so very much. Thank you also to Jimmy and Quentin and Beyond Broke. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. Yes. Bravo, everyone.